Hello, welcome to the channel Why Stories. Enjoy watching. I don't even know how this could happen. An educated looking man in professorial glasses, dressed in casual home sportswear and slippers, stood in the doorway of the apartment, but we didn't call an ambulance, believe me. Behind the man, a weak, barely audible moan could be heard. Who was moaning in there? Nuri, the paramedic who had arrived with the ambulance, tried to peer inside the apartment over the man's shoulder. I clearly heard someone moaning just now. Senorita, I already told you, we didn't call any ambulance. Right now, just leave here. The man standing in the doorway's voice trembled with barely suppressed anger. The moan repeated, but louder this time. And now it was clearly audible a woman was moaning. Refusing to listen to the man's objections any longer, resolutely pushing him aside, Nuri stepped into the apartment, and behind her came the rest of the ambulance crew, Senor Sotillo, a middle-aged doctor, and Valerio, a young, lanky male nurse. Peering into the room where the groan had come from, Nuri saw a woman lying face down on the couch. Her face, hidden under a thick mass of disheveled light hair, was turned towards the wall, and her hand, in an attempt to get up, clung desperately to the back of the couch. Without hesitation, Nuri rushed to the groaning woman. Turning the woman's face toward her, Nuri saw the vacant look in her light gray eyes, which seemed to be oblivious to everything around, wandering along the walls and ceiling of the room. The apartment owner jumped to Nuri and pushed her back. What do you think you're doing? I'll complain. The man was ready to attack the paramedic with his fists. Come on, get out of here right now. Care to explain what's going on here? Nuri said. Over her two years of working in the ambulance service, she had seen it all. The intellectual's inexplicable anger couldn't scare her. She had seen worse, alcoholics with axes losing their minds, or desperate mothers almost drowning their two-year-old babies in icy water. Answer me, or we'll call the police. Everything is fine with us, the man suddenly, unexpectedly calming down, changed his tone. This is my wife, Lucia. She, you see, well, how should I put it, she's not quite herself. As he spoke, the intellectual persistently pushed Nuri toward the door. Thank you for coming. Well, excuse us. Perhaps, Lucia, while I was distracted in the kitchen, called an ambulance herself. You can see for yourself what's wrong with her. Senor Sotillo and Valerio were already standing on the stairs and hadn't said a word the whole time. With a reproachful look at them, Nuri followed suit. But what's actually wrong with your wife? She asked, turning to the man, and then she closed the door behind them in a hurry. What happened? Well, you see, Lucia lost her child not so long ago. This led to a psychosis, and she's on tranquilizers. Well, you can see for yourself. So, goodbye and farewell. Finally, the intellectual managed to slam the door behind the ambulance crew. The doctor and the male nurse were already descending the stairs, and Nuri, pausing for a moment, followed suit. You're always looking for trouble, Nuria, Senor Sotillo said, getting into the car. Let's go. We've already wasted enough time for no reason, and we have another call, if you remember. Palacio, start the engine, the doctor ordered the driver. The car started moving and left the yard onto the street. You're not very compassionate, are you? Clearly, someone is in trouble, and you don't seem to care, Nuri grumbled as she settled into her seat in the car. Chatterboxes should be quiet, I don't see any subordination here. Keep talking, and I'll have more to say to you, Senor Sotillo joked roughly, focus on your job and don't take on extra. That lady probably needs psychiatric help, they'll handle it without us. That's how everyone thinks. And then we wonder why everyone just passes by when someone is unwelled priorities, huh? Rio, why are you so quiet? Are you on the same page? Medical assistant Valerio just shrugged in response, as if he couldn't do anything about it. The ambulance, with its sirens on, merged into the flow of traffic. The day went by in the usual routine, emergency calls, climbing the staircases of apartment buildings, the jolting ride and the ambulance rushing to help yet another person in distress. 
providing assistance to the injured and those in need everything was as usual and as always. Nuri breathed a sigh of relief when she realized that there was only one shift left and she would finally have a few much-awaited days off. It was the evening of her last working day. The ambulance, where Nuri worked, was parked at a traffic light at the intersection, having just provided assistance to an elderly man with a heart attack. Suddenly, a new call came in, and the medical team exchanged glances as they learned where they were heading. It was the same address as yesterday, where the intellectual man in professorial glasses had behaved strangely and aggressively, claiming that he hadn't called an ambulance. Nuri remarked, you see, not everything is so simple there. I knew right away that the professor wasn't telling the whole truth. At these words, Dr. Esteban Sotillo's face contorted in annoyance. He was tired of dealing with this young woman. The job was tough as it was, and she always found something not right or not the way it should be. In the recent past, Senor Sotillo had been a good surgeon, but he had to resign from the hospital on his own accord. The chief doctor, tired of the surgeon's alcoholism and the increasing complaints from patients related to it, gave him an ultimatum, either resign voluntarily or face disciplinary action later on. If a doctor was performing surgery while barely able to stand on his feet due to yesterday's drinking, and if his hand was trembling as he held the scalpel during the most critical moments, it didn't take much to imagine the potential disasters. The doctor chose to leave voluntarily and now served in the emergency medical service. Such a job left no room for drinking, and he hoped that this lifestyle would eventually help him overcome his alcohol cravings. However, as soon as the weekends or days off began, Senor Sotillo was immediately drawn into a binge. Now, as he finished his last hours of the shift, he was completely absorbed in thoughts of the upcoming free days, desperately craving a drink, and his head throbbed from the stressful work. And here was this paramedic with her moralizing. From the front seat, the driver Palacio spoke up. Esteban, we'll have to respond to that call again, especially since there are no other calls right now. We're only two blocks away from the address. Technically, we are obligated to respond to all calls, Nuri chimed in. Well, then you can go there yourself, the doctor responded immediately. Personally, I've climbed enough staircases today and I'd prefer to wait for you in the car downstairs, he added with a sly smile, feeling the urge for a drink intensify. Nuri sighed. Everyone was aware of Senor Sotillo's situation, and lecturing an adult and older person made no sense. The traffic light turned green, and the ambulance started moving. A minute later, the vehicle was already coming closer to the familiar driveway. Twilight was setting in, and the courtyard was empty. Most people had returned from work, warm lights from kitchen lampshades and fixtures illuminated many windows of the building. Nearby, there was the sound of casual rustling as a janitor, wielding his broom, tidied up the courtyard. A scruffy, unkempt dog wandered around freely, without a leash, alternately exploring the courtyard and circling the janitor. The ambulance stopped by the entrance. Nuri got out of the car and headed towards the door. Don't take too long in there, the doctor called after her. I'm sure they won't let you even pass the doorstep. Don't close the door, we'll wait in the car and get some fresh air, the doctor added, leaning back in his seat and closing his eyes. As Nuri reached the floor, she rang the doorbell for about two minutes, but no one answered the door. Inside, there was complete silence. She sighed, went back downstairs, and exited the building. Oh, look who's here, our mother Teresa, Senor Sotillo sarcastically remarked, half opening his eyes. Well, I told you there's no point going there, but you never listen. Nuri stepped back inside and sat down in her seat, lost in thought. She didn't like yesterday's situation at all, it reminded her too much of her childhood. Her childhood, where at least once a week she witnessed the same scene. Her father, seemingly calm and positive, hardly drinking or smoking, regularly tormented her mother without shying away from physical abuse. None of the neighbors suspected what was happening in their family. Her mother, embarrassed in front of people, never raised her voice or cried out loud when her husband, in his words, initiated the educational process. Nuri couldn't understand why her mother needed to be educated in the first place. 
When she asked her father about it once, she received an even more cryptic response. Your mother is a very, very bad woman, her father whispered ominously. He leaned over his daughter and looked at her from above with cold, strange eyes. Nuri felt at that moment that it wasn't her father at all. But you, my little girl, you're not like her, are you? Her father's voice became even more menacing. Nuri was very scared and ran away, hiding in the corner behind the refrigerator in the kitchen. She grew up, trying not to get involved in her parents' relationship anymore. But one day, her mother died suddenly under strange circumstances she was found hanging in the corridor. There was no one at home. Her father discovered his deceased wife when he came home from work. However, the investigation into her death revealed some inconsistencies in her husband's story. After some time, evidence emerged suggesting that he was the one who had committed the crime. Nevertheless, her father was not convicted. A psychiatric examination concluded that he was mentally ill. At the moment, he was living in a psychiatric hospital, and Nuri blamed herself for turning a blind eye to what was happening at home. If only I had been braver, my mother would still be alive, she thought, realizing that nothing could be undone. The behavior of the intellectual man in glasses vividly reminded her of her own childhood, the same appearance, positive facade, sudden bursts of rage, and mood swings. Nuri knew what this could signify. Well, are we finally going, our champion of justice? The doctor said, reaching for the door to close it. Palacio, why are we waiting? Who are we waiting for? Palacio, wait, something's not right here, Nuri said to the driver who was about to start the engine. Maybe we should report yesterday's incident to the police? Nuria, enough already. What will you tell them? Senor Sotillo pulled the door. Suddenly, there was a loud bark nearby. The dog that had been wandering in the courtyard next to the janitor suddenly leaped to the open doors of the ambulance and, in a furry, unkempt bundle, entered the vehicle. The doctor, taken by surprise, fell back onto the seat. Nuri froze in shock, overwhelmed by the loud barking and the sudden intrusion of the dog. Where did you come from? Senor Sotillo grabbed the dog by the collar and tried to pull it out. The dog, baring its teeth, growled menacingly in response. Senor Sotillo, wait, Nuri quickly spoke up. Hidden in the gray, unkempt fur around the dog's neck was a crumpled piece of paper sticking out from under the collar. Nuri pulled it out and unfolded it. What are these scribbles? She thought in surprise, trying to examine the message. What's there? Medic Rio pushed aside his phone and looked at the paper. Help, woman trouble, husband bad, woman cry all time, Rio read. What kind of nonsense is this? He chuckled. Nuri raised her eyes. The janitor was standing next to the car. Senor, please take your dog away immediately. It's dirty and unkempt, and this is a medical vehicle, after all, the doctor told the janitor. The janitor silently took the dog by the collar and led it outside while still standing by the car doors. Did you write this note? Nuri asked the janitor. He was a swarthy, middle-aged man of Asian descent. Holding a broom under his arm and using his other hand to restrain the dog by the collar, he made several hand gestures near his face. Nuri understood the janitor was a deaf mute. As part of her work, she had occasionally encountered people who couldn't speak, so she understood sign language. Seeing that the girl had started communicating with him using signs, the janitor became more animated and began responding to Nuri. Oh, come on, the doctor grumbled impatiently. Come on, Palacio, let's go, he patted the driver on the shoulder. The car's engine started. Nuri continued communicating with the janitor through sign language. He made a few more gestures and then nodded, stepping aside while holding the broom. The ambulance pulled out onto the street. Nuri asked, Aren't you even a bit concerned about what I found out? We should go to the police. What, that bespectacled professor guy with a blue beard, you mean? Medic Rio grinned. The vigilant guardian of cleanliness informed you that this intellectual fried up his crazy wife and ate her with mustard, no doubt. 
You're underestimating this, Nuri replied and explained what she had learned from the janitor. According to him, the woman's husband was a monster. He never allowed her to go anywhere alone. But a while ago, she slipped and fell on the wet grass after rain, and the janitor saw that her legs were covered in huge bruises underneath her raised skirt. The woman managed to ask the janitor for help when a couple of days ago her husband, during an argument on the street over a parking space in the area, got distracted. While they were arguing loudly, the woman quickly approached the janitor, who was cleaning the yard at that moment, and handed him a note. The janitor could barely read that she was in danger. She had once tried to call the police, but her husband, realizing her plans, threatened to kill her. So, the woman decided to take a different approach. She secretly called for an ambulance and left a note asking the janitor to inform the ambulance crew about her situation if her husband didn't let the medical professionals into the apartment. When the ambulance arrived at the call yesterday, unfortunately, the janitor had stepped away at that moment. After the ambulance had left, the janitor saw the distressed woman at the window waving her hand. When the janitor approached, he noticed a note thrown out of the window by the woman. In the note, she informed that she would call for an ambulance again tomorrow and asked him to try to convey to the medical professionals that she needed help urgently. Moments later, her husband rushed out of the entrance, yelling something, and ran toward the janitor. He must have noticed that his wife had thrown the note out of the window and demanded it back. The janitor had to hastily crumple up and throw the paper into a trash bin, pretending to be mentally challenged in front of the enraged and mentally unstable husband. Suspiciously eyeing the janitor, the husband eventually decided that he was too stupid to understand what his wife had thrown out of the window and returned to the building. The janitor, fearing that he might not be able to explain the situation to the ambulance crew, had the idea to attach the handwritten note to his dog's collar and instructed the dog to run towards the ambulance. The dog turned out to be even smarter than expected. It jumped into the vehicle with the medical professionals and thus drew attention to the note from the janitor. Fortunately, Nuri was skilled in sign language, allowing her to understand what had happened. What a clever doggy! can you believe it? The doctor commented with a smirk. And you, Nuria, should consider writing detective stories. You're like our local Agatha Christie. But how can we help this unfortunate woman, even if all of this is true? There's nothing we can do. The ambulance was already pulling into the station. The shift was coming to an end. The tired medical professionals bid farewell to each other, passing on the work to the next shift, and went home for the weekend. Nuri spent the entire first free day catching up on sleep. The 24 hours of rest had done her body good. She pondered how she could help the woman who had ended up in a difficult situation, the wife of that professor, as she referred to the strange man in glasses who had refused to let the ambulance into the apartment. Nuri suddenly realized who she could ask for advice. Her classmate Daniel served as a police officer, and he would surely know what to do in such a situation. Searching for Daniel's phone number, Nuri called him. She and Daniel had no special relationship beyond being classmates since the first grade, occasionally chatting as friends. Nuri had suspicions that Daniel had feelings for her, but that was as far as it went. Beyond her hunches, they had no deeper connection. When they finished school, life had separated them from their former friends and loves. This year, Nuri had attended her high school reunion. The first person she saw upon arriving at the event was Daniel. Friends were delighted to see each other again and spent the entire evening together. When they said their goodbyes, they exchanged phone numbers. Daniel had called a couple of times, inviting her to meet up, but Nuri had never found the time due to her demanding job. Dialing Daniel's number, Nuri patiently waited for him to answer. Eventually, her classmate picked up. Nuri suggested meeting up and explained that she wanted to consult with him. Daniel was at work and proposed that Nuri come over closer to lunchtime, so he suggested they could grab lunch together somewhere. After declining, Nuri busied herself with household chores. Her weekends were the only time she could keep her home tidy. Completing her cleaning chores by noon, Nuri took a shower, put on a silk summer dress, applied light makeup, grabbed a small leather handbag, and left the house. 
Daniel's workplace was on the ground floor of one of the residential five-story buildings. After a short bus ride, within half an hour, Nuri was already climbing the steps from the street to a small office with a separate entrance assigned to the local police officer. Daniel sat at a table and talked on the phone. When he saw Nuri, he waved at her in greeting, pointed to a chair next to his desk, and asked her to wait. She sat down and looked around. There was nothing special in the surroundings, just a typical office. Meanwhile, Daniel finished his call. Well, hello again, he said, smiling. I'm glad you found the time to meet up. Want to go outside? I was just about to have lunch. The classmates went outside and walked towards the park. What did you want to talk to me about? Daniel asked Nuri. Nuri explained the situation that had occurred during their ambulance call. You know, for some reason, I'm convinced that the woman isn't as crazy as her husband makes her out to be. I know all too well how these domestic situations can end. How do you know this? Daniel asked. You haven't been married yourself yet. Why do you assume this professor is an abuser? The note that ended up with the janitor doesn't prove anything. The woman might have been genuinely distraught. There you go, too, Nuri said indignantly. Yes, I haven't been married yet, but I've seen what happened to my own father and my mother, who, as you may recall, passed away. I watched my father constantly abuse her and did nothing about it. I didn't know that anything like that had happened in your family, Daniel said. We all knew in class that your mother had passed away, and your father, unable to cope with the grief, ended up in a mental institution. Then your aunt came and took custody of you instead of your parents. That's all we knew. Of course, that's all you knew. Nobody wanted to air their dirty laundry back then, Nuri replied. But if you only knew how much I still blame myself for giving in to my father's intimidation and pretending that what was happening in our home didn't affect me, but you were just a child, Daniel reassured her. You shouldn't blame yourself for anything. And I have no doubt about what you're saying. I just want to consider the situation objectively. You've come to me as a specialist, after all. So I'm trying to understand it from that perspective, he added. Unfortunately, from Daniel's perspective, there was currently nothing to accuse the bespectacled professor of. There were no official complaints from his supposedly injured wife, and the note passed to the deaf janitor from a foreign country held little weight. Even if a representative of the law, such as the local police officer, visited his apartment, the owner had every right to deny them entry. So, what do we do now? Nuri asked, sounding disappointed. I'm convinced that the janitor didn't make up this story with the note, and the woman herself didn't seem crazy. Rather, she appeared to be someone experiencing physical suffering. Her husband didn't even allow her to be examined, and I'm sure that if he did, we would find signs of violence on her body. Well, in that case, there's one thing I can do to help, Daniel replied. I'll find out who the local police officer is for that address and ask them to try to enter that apartment under some pretext. Daniel took out his phone and started making some calls. After a few calls, he said, Turns out I know the local police officer for that address. We went to school together. His name is Fernando, Fernand Galvin. Write down his phone number. I just called him, and he agreed to listen to your concerns. If necessary, you can go to see him today. He's on duty. In the meantime, we can grab a bite to eat as we planned. No, Daniel, I'm sorry, but let's do it another time. Perhaps this woman needs urgent help. Thank you for your assistance. Well then. Daniel was slightly disappointed by the refusal. They had finally met, and... This won't be the last time we see each other, Nuri said, trying to reassure him as she noticed a bus approaching. Goodbye, call whenever you need, she waved to Daniel and rushed to the bus stop. The police station, where local police officer Fernando worked, was located in a new high-rise building on the ground floor, which was not used for residential purposes. Nuri entered the premises and looked around. The spacious office was furnished with new light furniture, including cabinets with shelves and several desks. One young man in a police uniform was sitting at a desk, typing on a computer keyboard. 
Nuri greeted him and asked for Fernando Galban. The young man in uniform raised his head from the keyboard and looked at her with interest. Good day to you too. I'm police officer Fernando Galban. He introduced himself. And you must be Nuri, Daniel Vasquez's classmate, right? Yes, that's me, replied Nuri, taking a seat on the chair next to his desk. Well, go ahead. Tell me what happened here, Fernando said, preparing to listen to Nuri. After she recounted the situation with the ambulance call and the strange behavior of the spectacle department owner, the police officer said, This address is nearby, and the whole neighborhood and building are considered quiet and trouble-free. Regarding this professor, as you call him, there have been no incidents related to him so far. I know the janitor. His name is Farrick, if my memory serves me right. I've seen his dog multiple times, and there haven't been any complaints against him either. He cleans the courtyard every day and doesn't drink. So, it seems you weren't able to examine the professor's wife, as I understand it. No way. Nuri replied. The owner behaved unreasonably aggressively, was nervous, and threatened to report us for trespassing. The janitor himself saw horrible bruises on his wife's legs. The woman is clearly frightened. All right, I understand you, Fernando replied. However, you must realize that I have no reason to show interest in these people. It's strange that the janitor didn't come to me right away with this matter. Fernando, please understand, the woman said she tried to call the police, but her husband found out and threatened to kill her, Nuri passionately explained. I know from personal experience what seemingly quiet and positive people can be. My own father drove my mother to suicide with his regular abuse, and yet no neighbors or acquaintances had any idea of what was happening in our family. This professor exhibits all the signs. He looks like an intelligent, perfectly sane person, but in reality, there are outbursts of aggression, sudden mood swings, and unexplained anger. I'm sure that if we were able to examine his wife, we would undoubtedly find signs of violence and abuse. His wife was moaning the whole time while we were trying to figure out what was going on, and her husband claimed that her condition was simply due to taking tranquilizers. But don't forget, I am a medical professional. All right, sighed the local officer in response. It seems like fate doesn't want me to finish the report today. Let's go to the address and take a look, although it's possible that the owner is not at home in the middle of the day, said Fernando, putting on his cap. The professor's house was very close to the police station. In the courtyard, two young mothers with baby strollers were sitting on a bench, engaged in a leisurely conversation. An elderly woman was rocking a child on a swing. A slightly older child nearby was molding sandcastles in a sandbox. The janitor was nowhere to be seen, a broom lay under the trees, and there was a plastic bucket with trash. Farrakh's shaggy dog sprawled on the ground in the shade of acacia bushes. Nuri and Fernando entered the building. After reaching the floor, the local officer listened carefully. A faint sound of a TV working quietly could be heard in the apartment. The local officer, holding his tablet under his arm, pressed the doorbell button. Suddenly, silence fell inside the apartment. Fernando rang the doorbell again. As if in response to this, muffled female crying came from behind the closed door. Sonora Salada, open up, it's the police. I can hear that you are at home. What do you want? I didn't call the police, an irritated male voice suddenly came from behind the closed door. Go away. I wouldn't advise talking to a police officer like that, Fernando sternly said. I'm your local police officer, Fernando Galvin. Check my ID. Fernando took out his ID and held it up to the door peephole. If you don't open the door immediately, believe me, we will find a way to enter, but under different circumstances, he warned. Behind the door, there was a moment of dead silence, then the door lock clicked and the door opened. At the threshold stood the owner of the apartment, wearing professorial glasses. Are you Esteban Salada? The local police officer asked him, Yes, I am, the man replied affirmatively, his eyes darting around, and his face revealing panic and an inexplicable fear. What do you want, officer? Salada asked, trying to maintain a calm tone. Everything is quiet here, 
We're not alcoholics or drug addicts. May I enter the apartment? Said Fernando, walking into the hallway. Nuri followed him. Salada's face twisted with anger. He hadn't immediately noticed the presence of the young woman. I recently took over this district and wanted to get acquainted with the residents. The police officer continued, entering the kitchen. Do you live here with your wife? Fernando checked his tablet. Lucia Salada, am I right? Taking advantage of the situation, Nuri entered the room. Salada's spouse was nowhere to be seen. A crumpled blanket hung from the couch onto the floor, and a fallen pillow lay next to it. The couch was empty. Peering into the bedroom, the young woman also found no one. There was a strange spike belt, reminiscent of a dog collar, hanging on the back of the large double bed. Nuri returned to the kitchen. And where is your wife now? The local police officer asked the apartment's owner. I'd like to meet her as well. Nuri noticed that Salada's glasses had suddenly fogged up, and his eyes beneath the glasses betrayed anxiety. The man remained silent in response. Strange, we just heard her voice a moment ago, Fernando remarked. Or is she hiding from the police if she suddenly felt the need to lock herself in the bathroom? Unexpectedly, the local officer's phone rang. Answering it, Fernando spoke to the apartment's owner. I'll come back later. I'm being called in for work. Then I'll stay here for now, Nuri declared. We can also check on your wife. If you recall, I'm a medic, and it's clear that Lucia needed medical attention. You have no right, Salada replied with unexpected aggression. How do you assume that Lucia needs help? If she was crying, so what? Women cry for any reason, as you well know. I protest. Get out of here. Nuri, he's right, Fernando said. We have to leave now. I'm urgently needed at work, he continued, leading the young woman out of the apartment and down the stairs. In one of the apartments in our district, there was an attempted murder, and they're looking for me regarding the residents there. So, I'm sorry, but for now, I've done what I can. But please call me tomorrow, we can visit the Saladas again. And you can examine the owner's wife. I'm afraid today I won't be able to do that. Fernando bid farewell and left. Nuri looked around, the janitor, Farrakh, still hadn't appeared. His shaggy dog was sound asleep under the bushes, occasionally twitching its paws in its sleep. Raising her eyes upward, the young woman suddenly noticed Salada in the window, watching her from behind the curtain. Meeting Nuri's gaze, he quickly stepped back from the window and disappeared from sight. Nuri stood in the yard for a moment and then left. Upon returning home, the young woman prepared lunch. After eating, she immersed herself in reading. The following year, she planned to take her exams for medical school and was slowly preparing for them. In the evening, Daniel called her to check how she was doing. Her classmates suggested meeting up again and going to the movies, but Nuri wasn't tempted by the offer and preferred to stay home and go to bed early. Daniel was left with nothing once again. In the morning, after breakfast, Nuri called the local officer Fernando. Fernando was currently occupied with work, and then his superior was waiting for him, insisting that he come as soon as possible. Nuri understood that she would have to try to get into the Salada's apartment on her own, without Fernando's help. She tried to convince herself that maybe her colleagues were right, and she was unnecessarily fixated on the Salada couple's story. Perhaps she was simply projecting her own mother's death onto the lives of others. Yes, Salada reminded her of her father. But did all nervous, intellectual-looking men in glasses necessarily have to be monsters and psychopaths like her own father turned out to be? Of course not. Moreover, it would be foolish to spend her weekend interfering in someone else's life. Nuri sighed, thinking about her weekend, there was only one more day left, and then it would be back to calls, patients, often sleepless nights, and carrying stretchers up and down the stairs. All right, it's time to put an end to this story about Salada and his wife, Nuri thought. Suddenly, she vividly remembered one detail, the strange collar with a chain and sharp metal spikes hanging on the back of the Salada's bed. What was it doing there? Was it for a wolfhound's neck? There were no signs of a dog in the apartment. 
Nuri decided that since the local officer Fernando was occupied, she would try to talk to the apartment's owner again, and if possible, his wife too. She gathered herself and left the house. Sitting on the bus, she called Fernando. Learning where Nuri was going, Fernando said with concern, Nuri, it's better if you don't go there alone. Yesterday, I looked into some old cases and found an interesting fact. This Salada was already involved in a case related to a woman's death. Guess who that woman was? His first wife. She died, drowning in the bathtub. The investigation concluded that she must have accidentally knocked a hair device. How do you call it? Fernando pondered, a curling iron, that's it. Her husband wasn't at home at that moment, and when he returned, he discovered her body. It's a classic case. However, there was something strange about it, bruises on the deceased's neck and ankles. Despite these signs indirectly indicating signs of struggle, the investigation didn't find grounds for further inquiry. Fernando, do you see now why I was worried? Exclaimed Nuri. Nuri, it seems your suspicions may be justified, the local officer replied. Interestingly, at that time, Salada himself had an alibi. You won't believe it, but he is indeed a professor. He teaches at a university and heads a laboratory. Salada claimed he was at work at the time, so he didn't notice what happened to his nervous wife, so it caused her death. Don't you think, Fernando, that our professor seems to have an unusual run of luck with mentally unstable wives? Nuri said doubtfully. Yes, I agree. Something does seem off, the local officer observed. Nuri, if he's guilty of his first wife's death, it's best for you not to go there alone, added Fernando, sounding concerned. If it turns out he's a murderer and a psychopath, it could be dangerous. Let's do this. I'll be available in about 30 minutes, and we'll go to the Saladas together. When you arrive at the location, wait for me, and don't go into the apartment alone under any circumstances. Can you promise me that? Nuri promised that she would wait for Fernando on site. In the courtyard of the building, the janitor was sweeping the asphalt pathways, and his dog was nearby, circling around. Nuri approached and communicated with him using sign language. It turned out that Farrakh hadn't seen anyone from the Saladas yesterday evening or today. While waiting for Fernando, Nuri sat on a bench near the entrance. The local officer was running late. After some hesitation, she decided to go up to the Salada's apartment. There was no answer when she rang the doorbell. It felt like the sound came from an empty apartment. Nuri was about to leave when she noticed a crumpled piece of paper lying in the corner by the door. She unfolded it, and it turned out to be a note pleading for help. In hurried, small handwriting, Lucia, Salada's wife, reported that her husband, fearing another visit from the local officer, was taking her to their summer house, where he intended to keep her for an unspecified period. She urgently requested assistance, as her husband, in a fit of rage, could potentially kill her. The address of their summer house and the plot number in the suburban cooperative were provided at the bottom of the note. Nuri rushed outside and approached the janitor. Using sign language, she explained the situation to Farrakh and asked him to wait for Fernando and hand the note to him. The janitor agreed with a nod. Nuri called a taxi and gave the driver the address of the Salada summer house. On the way there, she called Fernando. When the local officer learned that Nuri was already on her way alone, he switched to using informal language and expressed concern. Have you gone mad? I'm almost there. Why didn't you wait for me? But we don't know what's happening at the summer house right now, Nuri argued. What if every minute counts and Lucia is in imminent danger? All right, here's the deal, Fernando said sternly. When you arrive at the location, do not, under any circumstances, approach the house. Wait for me this time. This is not a request, but an order from a police officer, or else, know that I can put you behind bars for 15 days, he joked before hanging up. Nuri firmly promised to wait for Fernando on site. After a bit of confusion along the country roads, the taxi dropped Nuri off in front of the correct house. She looked around. Due to a mesh metal fence, there was no sound, and the country house itself didn't appear to be inhabited. 
There was a lock on the door handle, and the curtains in the windows were tightly closed. The neighboring plots also seemed vacant. In compliance with her promise to Fernando, Nuri stopped by the gate, waiting for his arrival. Suddenly, someone tapped her shoulder softly, and right above her ear, she heard a voice. Here comes our brave little altruistic bird. Nuri turned around sharply. Behind her, with a sinister smile, stood Salada. I had no doubt that you'd rush here, our rescuer. In the next moment, Nuri felt a sharp blow, and her consciousness faded. When she woke up, she realized she was in some kind of room with a cement floor, and nearby, she heard a faint groan. Turning her head, she saw Lucia Salada, who was standing in the opposite corner. The spiked collar from the Salada's bedroom was wrapped around her waist, secured to a metal ring in the wall, preventing the woman from sitting or falling. Lucia's hands were pierced with spikes from top to bottom, causing them to bleed with every movement, and her face and neck were covered in black and blue bruises. Nuri jumped to her feet and rushed to Lucia. At that moment, the door to the room opened, and Salada entered. Well, all the little birds have gathered, he said contentedly. This will be fun. You're a psychopath, Nuri exclaimed. Your wife needs urgent medical help. Get any medications you have and bring them quickly. Well, you, be quiet. I'm in charge here, Salada's eyes filled with malice. The local officer will be here soon, so it's in your best interest to release both me and Lucia as soon as possible, Nuri said. Salada suddenly burst into laughter. You're mistaken, little bird, he said mockingly. You're, what's his name, Galbin, right? He won't come here. I wrote that note myself. I think you figured that out. And the address in it, it's not where you, my little birds, are currently sitting in a cage. So, searching for your officer will take a long time. Suddenly, Salada fell silent, and all traces of his aggression disappeared. You know, you're right. Lucia does need medical attention. My poor girl. Salada approached his wife and ran his hand over her face, pushing her tangled hair away from her face. What if she dies prematurely? Nuri became truly terrified. Trying not to show her fear, she stood up and immediately realized that a wide ring, chained to a hook protruding from the wall, was surrounding her ankle. This is a whole prison here, she thought in horror. Salada left and returned, holding a bottle of antiseptic, cotton, and a bandage. He removed the collar from his wife's waist, and Lucia collapsed onto the floor in helplessness. Dragging the wounded victim closer to Nuri, Salada ordered the paramedic to help his wife. Your wife needs more serious medication, Nuri remarked, trying to stem the bleeding from the woman's wounds. Lucia moaned. Shut your mouth, Salada suddenly became furious, then left and locked the door behind him. Meanwhile, Fernando had arrived at the Salada's house, read the note, and realized the urgency of the situation. He decided to call a taxi immediately. After some consideration, he gestured for the janitor to come with him. When the car arrived, Fernando and the janitor got in. Farrakis' shaggy dog also jumped in after them. The taxi driver objected to having a dog in the car, but Fernando, thinking the dog might come in handy, stated that the dog was accompanying them for official purposes. The taxi dropped them off at the designated house and drove away. The local officer and Farrick stood by the house. The janitor's dog, sniffing around the grass and bushes near the fence, began to explore the surroundings. Everything was quiet. After circling the house, the men found no one on the property. On the bench near the porch lay a small garden knife. Fernando picked it up and, inserting it into the gap between the window frames, opened the window slightly. One by one, they climbed inside. After searching all the rooms, checking the closet and the basement, they found no one. The house was empty. The local officer dialed Nuri's phone number, but there was no response. Fernando realized that Salada had likely deceived them, and now not only his wife, but also Nuri was in mortal danger. The women could be anywhere right now, and the search could potentially be prolonged indefinitely. They needed to find a solution urgently and act immediately. 
the men walked out of the property onto the path. Suddenly, Fernando felt the wet nose of a dog nudge his hand. The janitor's dog, having run around in the bushes, had returned and was standing at the local officer's feet, looking up at him with intelligent amber-brown eyes. Then the dog barked loudly, nudged Fernando's hand with its nose again, and looked expressively in a certain direction. Suddenly, it clicked for Fernando. He took out the note found by Nuri under the door and brought the piece of paper to the dog's nose. Search, search, Fernando said. The dog, whining softly, turned and ran in the direction it had indicated. The men followed it. After the psychopath Salada had left, Nuri continued her efforts to help his unfortunate wife. Blood continued to seep from her wounds, and at some point, the paramedic realized that the cotton and bandages brought by her tormentor might not be sufficient. Lucia stopped groaning and seemed to fall into a deep sleep, exhausted by the torture. Anxiously concerned for her, Nuri quickly examined her surroundings. It felt like they were in a room resembling a concrete basement or cellar. In the corner on the floor stood a metal bucket with water, and on the water's surface floated an aluminum ladle. Right above Nuri's head, there was a small window, relatively high above the floor, through which daylight filtered in. She strained to listen, but could only hear silence outside. I wonder where we are, Nuri thought. However, it was far more important to think about how to escape from here. Nuri, accustomed to extreme situations through her work, had long lived with the sincere belief that there were no hopeless situations. How many times had her colleagues given up during tough calls, yet each time something inside Nuri compelled her not to give up, to keep fighting for a person's life, even when everyone else was ready to admit defeat in the battle for someone's survival? Nuri didn't blame her colleagues for this. Working in an ambulance crew was not easy. Witnessing constant pain and suffering could gradually lead some healthcare professionals to develop a kind of professional desensitization. People get used to everything, she thought, and perhaps it was not without its merits. Sometimes, she reflected, in emergency situations, it was necessary to inflict pain in order to provide help, especially when there was no time for lengthy deliberation. Nuri understood all of this, but in her two years of work, she had never accepted a philosophical view of life and a person's health. Therefore, every time she heard the Dr. Igor Sergeyevich's favorite expression in cases where they couldn't help a patient, if they die, they die, it stung her ears. Knowing all of this, Nuri still fought to the end and often emerged victorious. It was difficult to accept that, for example, a very young child of only two years old would stop breathing in her arms, and her colleagues were ready to declare the child dead and move on to the next call. Remarkably, in the skilled hands of paramedic Nuri Baptista, even those who were thought to have no chance of survival sometimes came back to life, even to the amazement of their loved ones. Despite being locked in a room with a psychopath who was completely unhinged and with a wounded woman in her arms, Nuri couldn't help but feel fear initially. However, her habit of quickly regaining her composure kicked in this time as well, and surprisingly, the fear faded away. Lucia was sound asleep on the floor, and the bleeding from her wounds had stopped. Nuri got up and looked up. The window was about a meter above her head. Trying to peer through it, she jumped and grabbed the edge of the narrow windowsill with her hands. She managed to place her elbows on the windowsill and look outside. The chain attached to her ankle tugged. The window was covered with dirty glass, but Nuri could still see that a forest stretched around their makeshift prison. Right in front of the window were the rough trunks and dark green needles of fir trees. Suddenly, the lock on the door clicked. Nuri, instantly lowering her hands, silently jumped down. The chain restricting her movement betrayed her with a jingle. Salada entered the room and stared at the girl. So, how are we doing here? He asked in a quite calm voice. It was hard to believe that the same person could behave like a sadistic maniac moments earlier. Is Lucia asleep? Salada asked, approaching his wife. After making sure that she was fine, he eyed Nuri with suspicion. And what were you doing just now? He inquired in a strangely gentle manner. Nuri remained silent in response, fearing to provoke a sudden outburst of aggression from Salada. 
All right, Salada said. Sit tight for now, ladies, think about your lives, contemplate. We have an exciting task ahead, but I won't reveal anything just yet. Smiling strangely from under his professorial glasses, the psychopath left the room and locked the door behind him. The sound of the door closing woke Lucia up, and she opened her eyes. Seeing this, Nuri moved closer to her and asked, How are you feeling now? I'm glad you managed to fall asleep. Does it hurt badly? Your hands seem to have magical healing powers, Lucia weakly smiled in response, but now I don't even know how it can help us. It looks like my husband has decided not to leave us alive. I don't even want to know what he'll come up with next. Lucia paused and scanned the room with her eyes. Nuri understood that the woman wanted water, and she stood up, reaching for the ladle in the bucket of water. After giving her a drink, Nuri placed the ladle back and asked, But why do you think your husband will carry out his promise to kill you? Such people may just be fantasizing about it. These fantasies are part of their troubled inner life, so some of them are content with just dreaming that it might happen someday. Besides, your death is not in his best interest. When he loses the source of his sick fantasies, his entire reason for living may disappear, and who will be his victim then? You know, Nuri, living with a monster like my husband can hardly be considered a life at all, Lucia said with a heavy heart. All this time, I've been thinking that maybe Esteban will decide to end it all for me, which would immediately relieve me of my suffering. Don't talk like that, Nuri interjected. It may sound strange now, but there's always a way out. When I came here, I called your local police officer, so he's aware of what's happening. I'm sure they're looking for us already. Unfortunately, Salada outsmarted me, but that doesn't mean we should give up, Nuri added firmly. Lucia just sighed in response. To avoid causing problems for his wife, Salada regularly drugged her with something peculiar, after which Lucia fell into a kind of waking sleep, remembering little of what happened. Sometimes, Esteban would suddenly stop showing signs of mental illness and become someone entirely different. This could last for a week or a month. At those moments, Lucia thought that things might change, but deep down, she knew her husband was mentally ill and needed medical help. One day, during one of those lucid intervals, Lucia had dared to talk to Salada about it, instantly regretting her decision. When she mentioned the word doctor, her husband flew into a terrible rage. Remember, he said directly to Lucia's face, I don't need a doctor. I've told you before, I'm not crazy, but you, her husband pointed his finger at her chest. From now on, you'll be constantly drinking something for me. Salada, after hitting Lucia in the face, knocked her to the ground and, pinning her down with his knee, retrieved a small vial from a bedside table. Roughly prying her mouth open, he poured something in. Lucia coughed, but her husband made sure she swallowed everything that had been poured into her throat. There you go, Salada said triumphantly, ensuring that she had swallowed it all. Now you'll think less. Lucia never knew what her husband kept drugging her with. Afterward, she would enter a borderline state that made it difficult to move. Her thoughts were muddled, and it was impossible to concentrate on any of them. How long have you been married to Salada? Nuri asked. The first time you mentioned that you recently lost a child. I understood that you don't have any children. Only half a year, Lucia replied with a bitter smile. As for children, that's hardly possible at all. He lied about me losing a child, and my pregnancy was also a product of his imagination. When we met, he immediately said he dreamed of a family and children. He was very attentive and caring, took good care of me, and overall gave the impression of a positive and intelligent person, Lucia continued. Nuri listened attentively as Lucia recounted how Esteban had completely won her over with his attentiveness. He showered her with flowers, took her out to restaurants, spared no expense on gifts and compliments. At that time, Lucia felt like she had entered paradise. Having experienced the unhappy marriage of her past, where her husband constantly neglected and treated her disrespectfully, Lucia was certain that this time things would be different. Soon enough, Esteban proposed to her, and without a moment's hesitation, Lucia accepted. At the beginning, everything seemed fine. 
the newlyweds went on a honeymoon trip to warm destinations to enjoy their time together. One thing puzzled Lucia, though, Esteban wasn't in a hurry to engage in intimate relations. The reason he gave when Lucia asked about it seemed strange. Professor Salada cited his principles and old-fashioned upbringing. His passionate declarations of love and eagerness to enter into a legal marriage, and Lucia's opinion, didn't quite align with his reluctance to get closer to his beloved wife. Well, maybe he really was brought up in such traditions, Lucia reassured herself. He's a gentleman through and through. However, even after getting married, her loving husband didn't seem in a hurry to fulfill his marital duties. Initially, he used the excuse that they had tickets and needed to get ready for their trip. When the honeymooners arrived at their destination, finally free to start their married life together, Lucia realized that Esteban not only avoided getting close to his wife, but also that something more sinister might be at play, beyond natural modesty or a lack of self-confidence in an intellectual husband. Attributing Salada's strange behavior to shyness and doubts about his own abilities, Lucia didn't press her husband to engage in marital intimacy right away. Their week-long vacation together passed by unnoticed. They swam in the sea, sunbathed, visited picturesque places, drank local wines, and short, they relaxed, returning to their hotel room only before bedtime. Everything would start anew in the morning. The couple was hardly ever alone, except for the fact that at the end of the day, they would collapse into bed, exhausted from their active pursuits and impressions. Esteban seemed content with this, even pleased, and he would rush Lucia to get ready and eagerly plan their next excursion every morning. One day, Lucia decided to outsmart Salada and, in the morning, feigned not feeling well. Thinking that it was time for one of them to take the initiative in bringing them closer, she woke up and refused to leave the house in the morning. Esteban was unpleasantly surprised by this turn of events. Staying in bed with a suddenly playful wife was clearly not part of his plans. Esteban went to breakfast alone, promising to bring some snacks and coffee to their room for Lucia. When he returned, carrying pastries and coffee for her, he was surprised to find that his wife wasn't in bed. Calling out to her, Esteban heard her voice from the bathroom. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary until he entered the bathroom and encountered a strange sight. The lights in the room were off, rose petals floated on the surface of the bath, and several lit water candles were placed around. On a stool beside the bathtub, there was a bottle of red wine and two glasses. On the floor lay Lucia's discarded robe, but Lucia herself was not visible. As her husband called out to her, he felt her arms wrap around his neck from behind. Esteban heard Lucia's mysterious laughter and turned to look. Lucia hugged him and tried to kiss him, but Esteban recoiled in horror. What are you thinking? You're behaving like some promiscuous girl. Get dressed immediately. What a disgrace. I never expected such filth from you, he muttered in disgust. What did you say? Did I understand you correctly? Do you consider intimate relations between spouses filth? Lucia was shocked by what she had heard. You know what, she said, putting on and fastening her robe. If you consider my desire to be with my beloved husband filth, then I guess I have nothing more to say. I regret believing in you and marrying you, she added, resolutely leaving the bathroom. Salada looked bewildered. Fearing that his wife would immediately leave him and go home, Esteban rushed after her while Lucia was already pulling out her suitcase, packing her things. Lucia, don't get so worked up, he said. You misunderstood me, but you don't understand what you're asking from me. I'm sure you won't like it, Salada babbled, watching his wife pack her suitcase. I'm such a fool, Lucia said. I should have realized right away that your reluctance to sleep with me wasn't just a whim or old-fashioned upbringing. Wait, her husband suddenly said. All right, if you want it that badly, then I agree, but don't complain if you don't like it. I warned you. And what happened next? Nuri asked, Lucia, who had fallen silent for a moment. What happened next? Lucia paused, lost in thought, was nothing. Nothing happened. He couldn't do anything. It felt like Esteban just went into some kind of stupor, and all my attempts to awaken the man in him ended in nothing. 
When I, having lost all patience, stepped back, he calmly got up and said he had warned me about all of this, but I had chosen not to give up so easily. Salada didn't resist anymore when I repeatedly tried to improve our marital life. One day, I succeeded, but it would have been better if nothing had happened at all. So your husband lied when he said he was incapable of having full intimate relations with a woman? Nuri asked. Lucia sighed in response. After finally managing to provoke a male reaction in her husband in bed and even entering into intimate contact with him, Salada suddenly flew into a wild rage. His face contorted in a horrible spasm. He pushed his wife away, throwing her to the floor. Uttering dirty curses, Esteban struck the woman several times while she lay on the floor. Lucia lost consciousness. When she woke up, she was lying on the bed, covered with a sheet. Salada, frightened, was busy nearby, pressing a wet towel to her face. I told you, I told you, he muttered. You shouldn't have done that, and now, now you have to blame yourself, he added, switching to a sinister whisper. You're just a psychopath, Lucia said in horror. You're insane. What did you say? Salada yelled. I'm not insane. You're a filthy fallen woman. You took me by force, stained me with your filth, and you'll answer for it. Salada switched to a sinister whisper again. Lucio was terrified. But at that time, she didn't know that it was just the beginning. From that moment on, her life turned into a living hell. When Lucia decided to go home, Salada grabbed her by the throat and promised that he would simply destroy her and bury her somewhere, announcing to everyone that his wife had disappeared and no one would ever find her in a foreign country. Nobody dares to leave me. Got it? Salada hissed threateningly at his wife, preventing another attempt by Lucia to get away from him. Strangely, Esteban somehow concluded that his wife was pregnant. He alternated between showing unexpected care for her and yelling that he wouldn't allow any offspring conceived through deceit and filth to come into the world. It's unknown what was happening in his disturbed mind, but one day he started claiming that his wife was no longer pregnant and had recently lost a child. Now, this had become his constant delusional fantasy. A little later, another obsessive thought occupied his mind, a dream of killing Lucia. Almost every day, Salada openly expressed this desire to his wife, eagerly anticipating his future sadistic pleasure. That's when Lucia realized one thing she had to escape. Unlike Nuri, she had no doubt that her husband wasn't just fantasizing about murder, but was planning it. However, Salada seemed to sense that his wife's patience was running out. The unexpected intervention of Nuri and the local police officer in their family life made him hurry up. Lucia, whom her husband regularly drugged with an unknown substance, was sometimes ready to give up, thinking that it might be better to die quickly. Listening to Lucia's story, Nuri thought that maybe her colleagues were wrong in thinking that she couldn't sit still without a reason and had to get involved in everything. After all, this time her intuition didn't let her down. She reminded herself, so it's not over yet, and she never doubted that help would come in time and they would be saved, while the psychopath Salada would find his rightful place among people like him. Otherwise, why did fate bring me together with the Saladas in the first place if my intervention was pointless? Salada would have carried out his terrible plans long ago, the woman reflected. These thoughts were interrupted by the sound of an unlocking door. Salada entered the room, looking satisfied and triumphant. Well, my little birds, the psychopath said cheerfully, I have good news, the celebration begins. Hooray! Look what I've brought. Salada raised a large axe overhead. This is for you, my beauties, we're going to play executioner. I call dibs on being the executioner. Salada put a red knitted women's hat on his head, with openings for the eyes, nose, and mouth, resembling a balaclava. His professorial glasses strangely gleamed through the openings in the hat, as if they were gas mask lenses. And, of course, you'll be the victims, my little birds. Let's go, Salada stood Lucia, who groaned in pain, back on her feet. Then, he suspiciously stared at Nuri and said, As for you, brave savior, don't even dream of running away. I'll unchain you now, and you'll lead my wife to the place of our celebration. 
But if you think about escaping, know that Lucio will die immediately. Salada removed the chain from Nuri's leg, ordered her to take his wife by the arm, and commanded them to exit. Lucia walked with difficulty, her strength was fading, and it seemed like she didn't care about what was about to happen. Don't worry, we're almost there, the monster encouraged them, walking behind them on a narrow path leading deeper into the woods. Soon, a small clearing came into view, with a deep pit dug into the ground at its center. Come on, Salada joyfully announced. His eyes behind the fogged up glasses gleamed with madness. Let her go, Salada commanded, and Nuri gently lowered Lucia to the ground. We'll start with you, my beauty, the psychopath gloated, addressing Nuri. Nuri tensed up. Ignoring the fear gripping her entire body, she had no intention of giving in. Trying not to attract Salada's attention, Nuri looked around, trying to find something suitable for defense. Suddenly, her gaze caught a shovel lying at the edge of the pit. With a swift motion, she bent down and, lunging to the side, grabbed the shovel in her left hand. At the same moment, she delivered a sharp blow to the psychopath's leg with the shovel. Salada staggered and fell to the ground, losing his balance and crying out in pain, but he immediately got up with astonishing agility. His profanity filled the air, and Nuri saw Salada lifting the axe above her head. Fernando and the janitor Ferric were running after the dog that was racing ahead. The cottage area ended, and the dog suddenly stopped on a wide dirt road, sniffing the ground. Fernando realized that the dog had lost the scent. He looked around. A field stretched around them, with distant glimpses of forest on one side. The local police officer dialed Nuri's number again, but her phone remained unanswered. Suddenly, the dog growled and dashed towards the forest across the field. Looking in the direction the dog had gone, Fernando noticed a narrow sandy road and distinct tire tracks imprinted in the loose sand. Salada was likely in a car and turned there, thought Fernando as he sprinted after the dog. The janitor followed suit. Soon, the road led into the forest. The dog was racing far ahead. Suddenly, the sound of barking reached their ears, and the men, running toward it, unexpectedly found themselves in a small forest clearing. Right in the middle of the forest, they saw a small log cabin and a car parked nearby. Fernando rushed into the cabin. The room was empty, except for a small women's handbag lying on an old wooden table, covered with faded oilcloth. This is Lucia's handbag, the local police officer realized, peering inside the bag. It contained regular women's items and a turned-off phone. Fernando understood that the woman was somewhere nearby. Spotting a staircase leading to the basement, the local police officer headed there. Running down the steps, he pushed open the wooden door. The room was empty, but the chain attached to the wall and a collar with sharp spikes left no doubt. Women had been held here. Pushing thoughts of possibly being too late out of his mind, Fernando rushed outside. The janitor's dog was still barking and eagerly beckoning. Seeing the local police officer, it barked loudly and dashed further into the forest. The men followed. Nuri, clutching the shovel in her hand, prepared to fend off an attack. Like in slow motion, she saw the sharp edge of the axe rapidly approaching her head. Suddenly, a loud growl was heard, and Salada shrieked as if he were a slaughtered pig. Emerging seemingly out of nowhere, a gray, shaggy dog latched onto the psychopath's hand with a deadly grip. Due to the sudden pain, Salada dropped the axe, and the dog, a strong creature about the size of a German shepherd, swiftly knocked him down, depriving him of balance. With a loud growl, the dog continued to fiercely bark and, with a swift paw, pinned the terrified Salada to the ground. Help! The psychopath screamed desperately. Get this dog away from me. I can't stand dogs. I'm terrified of them. From behind the trees, Fernando and the janitor emerged. The local police officer rushed to Nuri. I'm okay, she reassured him. Salada hit me a little at first, but it seems like I don't even have a bump, the girl joked. We need to call an ambulance quickly. Lucia needs help, she added, searching for her phone in the handbag handed to her by the local police officer. 
Fernando also made a phone call requesting a team to pick up Salada and take him to the police station. Suddenly, the psychopath clutched his chest and began to wheeze and gasp for breath. Nuri rushed to him and removed the knitted mask with openings covering his face. Placing her fingers on his neck, Nuri realized there was no pulse. It seemed that Salada had suffered a sudden heart attack. Without hesitation, the paramedic started to administer aid, attempting to restart his stopped heart, but it was all in vain. Salada was dead. Nuri, it's for the best for everyone, the approaching local police officer said. Focus on Lucia, she needs help right now. Lucia, it's over now, Nuri said, approaching the woman and helping her to stand that the ambulance will arrive soon and we'll go to the hospital together. Thank you, Nuri, Lucia said warmly. If it weren't for you. Thank the one over there, the girl cheerfully replied, patting the thick fur of the janitor's dog standing nearby. If it weren't for him, who knows how this would have ended. Realizing that they were praising him, the dog licked Lucia's face and sat down beside her, lifting his front paw and waving it in the air. Looks like he's asking for a reward for his heroic deed, Lucia smiled. You'll get a reward, she assured him, stroking the dog's head as he wagged his tail. You'll have the tastiest meat lunch in the world. In response, the dog flashed a satisfied, toothy grin and continued to wag his tail. Fernando and the janitor also approached the dog. Seeing this, the dog didn't hesitate and once again began to wave his paw in the air, as if asking for a reward. Look at how resourceful he is, Fernando chuckled. He wants to tell us that he deserves a reward from us too. All right, you'll get your reward from us as well. Who's the real hero here? Of course, it's you. If you're enjoying it as well, leave a like and subscribe to the channel.